I want to take that as my text this morning from Mark's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 4 through 11. And so if you have a Bible handy, I want to invite you to uh, take that. Um, Mark is the second book in the New Testament after the uh, Gospel of Matthew. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, and beginning at verse 4. And I've titled my talk this morning, Focus of Love, Wellspring of Joy. Focus of love, wellspring of joy. Indeed, that certainly is what Jesus is, a focus of love and a source or a wellspring of joy, at least to God the Father, who says to Jesus at his baptism, and just before Jesus begins his, uh, his three-year ministry in Palestine, you are my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Are, are we, are, how, how, or how, um, how we have it in uh, the New Living Translation, where we read, and you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. And in these words, it seems to me that uh, there's, uh, we have from God the Father something of a not so subtle commendation uh, that we ought to love Jesus too, the way that the Father loves him, and experience him as the Father does, as a source of joy, if you will, even as a wellspring of great joy. As I was reading this, this reminded me of the words of Peter in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. And notice how the, the apostle speaks of both love and joy in relation to Jesus Christ and these believers uh, to whom he's writing. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. And even though you have not seen Jesus, this is many years after the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension, even though you have not seen Jesus, you love him. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. Joy that is beyond words to express. In our text, Mark uh, says that John the Baptist appeared on the scene in the Judean wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. When we compare this uh, to the uh, synoptic gospels, and in, in particular, uh, the gospel of Luke, this took place sometime between 27 AD and 29 AD, or as uh, Luke puts it uh, straightforwardly, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And he also adds that uh, uh, this all happened about the time that Jesus was about 30 years old. The Judean wilderness, and I've been there with some of you uh, not so many years ago, is not very far from Jerusalem. Uh, and it was, as it is today, uh, undeveloped and uncultivated, uh, a wild wasteland, if you will. And that's where John lived as a prophet uh, in the in the traditional biblical sense. And out there in the wilderness, uh, close by the Jordan River, uh, before it empties into the Dead Sea, John was a proclaiming a, a, a message of repentance. To repent, uh, the, the Greek word is metanoia, uh, means quite literally to, to, to think again or, or to change your mind. Um, T.D. Jakes in his book, Can You Stand to Be Blessed? In fact, I only have one book by T.D. Jakes. I think I bought it. I bought the in, in, a, in a gas station on a trip from California to Arizona. I was so taken by the, uh, by the title, Can You Stand to Be Blessed? But this is what Jake says. He says, the greatest freedom we all have is the freedom to change our mind. The greatest freedom we all have is the freedom to change our mind or the freedom to repent. And, and repentance is not just uh, to, uh, to change your mind per se, but to change your mind in such a way that it leads to a change of life. And that's what it means to repent, to change your mind about the way you're living or the way I'm living, uh, and to, in fact, to change the way that you're living or the way I'm living, uh, to turn from what we know and what God knows to be wrong and to begin pursuing earnestly and from the heart uh, what you and I know and what God knows to be right. And, and Mark uh, says that John uh, was
you're back. Am I ready to go again? Yes. We were talking about uh, repentance, and, and then and then uh, Mark talks about John uh, proclaiming in the Judean wilderness a message of forgiveness. Uh, the, I suppose the Greek word forgiveness is just as interesting uh, as the word repentance. The Greek word for forgiveness means release, uh, to to let go. And so when we repent, we're we're forgiven. That is to say that God releases us uh, from the guilt of our sin uh, and from the divine penalty that's due to our sin. And so when we are released uh, from the, uh, the penalty of sin uh, and the guilt of sin, we are by God uh, set free uh, to begin again, to start again, uh, uh, to, to leave the past behind and, and to pursue a fresh start, a new beginning, if you like. And this reminded me of the words of the apostle John in his first letter. Uh, in 1 John chapter 1 and beginning at verse 8, uh, where the apostle writes, he says, and if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We're all sinners. Uh, and we don't just sin in general, we sin in particular. There's particular sins uh, that we do, that we're aware of. And, and he says in verse 9, and if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to, to forgive us, uh, to, to release us from the guilt and the punishment due to that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A, a new start is what John is describing. Indeed, March says that uh, all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were uh, going out to John, that is John the Baptist, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River. And, and interestingly, in, in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel, it says, and they were confessing their sins. They were confessing to John. John would say, do you have any sins to confess before I baptize you? Uh, and that's part of repentance, isn't it? And so uh, they were confessing. Uh, he says here, Mark does, uh, that all the country of Judea and Jerusalem are going out to John. That is to say that all of the urban areas and the rural areas and the people that lived in them were going out. Uh, all those who lived in the southern region of Palestine were going out to hear John and they were being baptized and then they were confessing. Uh, the Greek word uh, for confession, uh, homologeo. Um, means uh, literally to, to say the same thing, to say the same thing, or, or if you like, uh, to express with words equal to the things that we've done, to, to, to name it, if, if you like, without rationalizing, uh, without comparing ourselves uh, to others in an attempt perhaps to suggest that our sins aren't that bad, uh, that, you know, everybody does it. Are, are to bring up that uh, other people do worse things. Uh, to confess is, if you like, to put it in a contemporary language, to tell it like it is, to say the same thing, to tell it like it is with God and with others, as was happening here. As people were going to be baptized by John, they were confessing to him uh, their sins. There's an interesting verse in, in uh, James' uh, letter, James chapter 5 and verse 16 that uh, isn't, isn't a lot made of it uh, in the church. Uh, but when you think about what was going on with John, and then you think about what James writes here, uh, it's sort of a striking thing, kind of makes us stop and think. But um, James, the half-brother of Jesus and the leader in the early church, wrote this. James chapter 5 and verse 16. He says, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. David Taylor in his great book, Open and Unafraid, the Psalms as a Guide to Life, uh, wrote, confession is a chance to be free from the secrets that distort and oppress us. Isn't that great? Isn't it, again, what uh, David wrote. Con confession is a chance to be free from the secrets that distort and oppress us. That made me think of, uh, of an adage that's uh, common uh, within the um, a recovery uh, community that goes like this. You're only as sick as the secrets you keep. Or you might put that in another way since we're talking about confession. And I think it applies, and I think this is true. 
You're only as sick as the sins you refuse to confess. And what's true for individuals, and in particular individual Christian persons, is equally true for churches that are made up of Christian people. Indeed, to be free and healthy, to be a free and healthy person, is to be a person who recognizes and confesses his or her sin. And to be a healthy church is to be a church made up of people who recognize and confess their sins to God and to one another maybe not to the whole church or large groups of people but at least to someone and then and then to deliberately reject uh, the the fearful and dishonest tendency that is rather common in churches to hide from one another and to pretend with one another or to put it more starkly to live lives that are a lie and then mark says that john was I was saying to the people that uh, after me, quote, uh, is coming one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie, which isn't a, a great deal uh, different uh, than him saying uh, that I'm, I'm not worthy to be a slave. In fact, to, to deal with people's feet in the ancient world, and m maybe still today, uh, to deal with people's feet was considered to be slave's work. It was kind of sort of the lowest thing that you could do. Um, in fact, uh, amongst disciples uh, and their rabbis, disciples were never required to deal with their with their uh, with their rabbis' feet because it was considered to be too it was considered to be too degrading. And so, if you had a rabbi and you were a disciple, uh, you didn't have to touch the rabbi's feet. And here, John is saying, "I'm not even worthy to do that to stoop down." and untie uh, the thong of his sandal to wash his feet or to do anything else. And then Mark says that John uh, was saying that, uh, quote, I have baptized you with water, which is exactly what he was doing, but one is coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I baptize you with water, one is coming. In fact, it's in the, the, the word coming is in the present tense in the Greek. He's on his way. <laughs> is what what John is saying. There's one who's coming right now who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In other words, John is saying that uh, one is coming after me, namely Jesus, and he'll be a baptizer too. Uh, and his baptism will be greater than mine, John is saying. Indeed, John is saying, I baptize with water that promises forgiveness of sins uh, and a fresh start. But the one coming after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And as a result, uh, your lives will be completely transformed. And not from the outside in, but from the inside out. And then Mark says that in those very days, in the days that John was baptizing and he was saying all of these things about the one who's coming after, in those very days, Jesus appeared. Jesus came uh, from Nazareth in Galilee where he had been living all of his life. And he was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And Mark says that when Jesus came up out of the water, immediately Jesus saw the heavens being torn open. I think, it's a, I think what's being referred to here is not just that the clouds were parted, but there was some sort of way in which Jesus was able to see from the Jordan River into heaven. And the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And then Mark says, and, and a voice came from heaven, a voice speaking to Jesus, saying, you are my beloved son. And with you, I'm well pleased. It's interesting if you notice that all the persons of the Trinity are represented, are represented here at, in Jesus, at Jesus' baptism. The Holy Spirit descends uh, like a dove. The father speaks to Jesus, and then the son sees have the heavens torn open and, and the spirit descending upon him. And then he hears the father's words of affirmation. Indeed, the father expresses words of affirmation, words of love and joy, that, that the son is the object and focus of his love. You are my beloved son, that he loves Jesus. 
and that the sun is to him a source or, if you like, a wellspring of great pleasure. And so I, I wonder at, about this not so subtle commendation. How about you? Do you love Jesus? Is Jesus a great source of pleasure for you? It was Timothy Keller who wrote, and I think it was my daughter Victoria who gave me this great quote. Timothy Keller said, anyone can find God useful. A growing Christian finds God beautiful. Isn't that something? Anyone can find God useful. A growing Christian finds God beautiful. And some of you watching this morning uh, perhaps uh, find Jesus useful in some way. Uh, maybe uh, you're seeking uh, something ultimate, something beyond him, hoping that he can be the delivery system. Uh, maybe peace of mind or some other thing. You don't pray much, but uh, maybe you're out of work. And so now uh, you're thinking, well, ah, might as well give Jesus a try. Maybe Jesus can get me a job or, or some other thing. Maybe Jesus can keep me out of hell. Uh, but what about beauty? Is Jesus uh, beautiful to you? And therefore the supreme object of your love and the ultimate source of your joy? It was a John Burke in his book, Soul Revolution, who wrote this. He said, no human being or material thing can ever satisfy your deepest longings because God has hardwired us for himself first. Listen to that again. No human being, that person that you might hold up and have on a pedestal, that child, that spouse, or whatever, no human being or material thing can ever satisfy your deepest longing because God has hardwired us for himself first. Or as someone else has written, our problem is not that we fail to love. We just love the wrong things, things that can never fill what Pascal called the God-shaped hole that exists within all of us. And so one of the supreme takeaways of the, the baptism event, the baptism of Jesus, is that God the Father loves Jesus with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I wonder if any one of us can afford to love him any less. Focus of love, wellspring of joy. Let us pray. I think, Lord, that we think of Jesus uh, too often uh, as um, somebody making demands on us. Uh, someone uh, that uh, when we think of him, uh, we think about how we're not living up to some standard that we, we expect that he is pressing upon us. But how many of us think of him as beautiful? As the object of our love, as the beloved, and how often do we think of him as a, well, a wellspring of joy? It was the psalmist who wrote in the 16th Psalm, in your presence is fullness of joy, Lord, and in your, in, in, at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And the same is true of Jesus, who's just as much divine as you, our Father, just as divine as the Holy Spirit. To worship him is no act of idolatry because he's as much God as you or the spirit. And so as we think about this and as we think about your attitude toward him, uh, may we think about our own attitude. And if it needs to be corrected, help us to correct it. That we might find joy unspeakable and full of glory as we love him whom we have, whom we have yet even to see. And this we pray in his name. Amen.